entire career as an editorial and commercial photographer, I've always had a love, a passion, maybe even like an addiction to wide open 1.4 lenses or Sumulux lenses, as those in the Leica world might know that terminology a little bit better. Every system I've used, Nikon, Canon, Sony, Hasselblad, and Leica, I've had a set of prime wide open 1.4 lenses to go along with that system. And today, basically, I'm gonna tell you why. And stay tuned until the end because I'll tell you why my former editor at the New York Times scolded me once for my abuse of 1.4 lenses. So don't make the same mistake I did, whether you're pro or amateur, I think you can learn from my little story here. First off, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Walton Craft Bags, my go-to bags for street photography, travel photography, camera straps even, and everyday carry bags. More on them later, or if you don't feel like listening to me talk, you can go right to the affiliate link in the description box below. So if you don't know what an F1.4 lens is, then you probably wouldn't have clicked on this, but really quick, meaning your aperture opens really wide, so F1.4, F2.8, F4, F5.6, F11, F7000, you get the picture. So wider opening, more light reaching the sensor, and more shallow depth of field. That's all I'm gonna talk about for that. If you don't know what that is, need to work your way up to this episode. So why use a 1.4 lens? Are they worth the extra money you're gonna pay? And yeah, you're gonna pay. Uh, for you, I have no clue. For me, yes, indeed they are, or else I wouldn't have made this episode. It's important to keep in mind that I shoot all of my editorial work with natural light. And even my commercial work, my commercial photography and video production business was built on that same natural light style. Sure, occasionally I use artificial light, but most of the time I start with natural light. And that's important to mention because many of the things I'm gonna talk about today won't matter so much to a studio photographer, a landscape photographer, or just anyone who shoots often with artificial lighting. So when it comes to my personal project work, my documentary work, my street photography work, or just going out and shooting for fun, I can sit on light, I can wait for it. I can even move on if I don't get it and come home empty handed although I don't usually do that. The point is, I can. For my assignment work and my commercial work, it's a whole different ball game. It's all about solving problems and making things work within parameters set by my client. I always plan for the best case scenario and best light, but you get it, things come up. Flexibility is a must have skill. Thinking on your toes is a must and figuring out how to impress my clients no matter what the circumstances are is just essential to what I do as a working photographer. It could be a situation like, okay, Justin, get a shot of the bamboo farmer in the mid-afternoon light because we find this person interesting and we happen to be here at this time and just make it work. Or I might be working with a writer and she said, oh, I, I interviewed that fisherman right there and I like what he had to say and it might end up in the article, And but we've got to catch a boat to the next island village in Laos, so can you just like in a minute get a quick portrait of him? Uh, on the fly, even though the background's kind of busy. Can you can you just make it work? Or I'm shooting a luxury resort and their golf course isn't finished yet and the model doesn't know how to golf properly, but we still need a shot of the model golfing in this one area. Can't do a wide because it's not finished yet. It's under construction, but can you still make it work? I can, and I did, and 1-4 helped me out a ton. So why and how? Well, first of all, low light performance is an obvious one here, but it's not necessarily what or how you think. Sure, you get more light when you're shooting at 1.4 because more light is reaching the sensor than a 2.8 lens, but sensors and denoising software now are pretty insane, so that's no longer that relevant. However, when you are shooting in low light, a wide open aperture indoors using only ambient light gives your subject separation from your background. It gives it that extra little pop. It gives you some depth, if you will, to your image. It also does this in bright light and ideal lighting situations, but it can really, really bail you out in low light situations. Like for example, trying to get a shot at an event of a friend or a travel story where that I just went on recently for the New York Times where the writer mentioned a boring sort of cup of coffee. I still needed a good shot of, still needed a detail to shine. I need to make a nice picture. Essentially, I needed to get something out of nothing. And while it would have been okay at maybe 2.8, that 1.4 just gave it that extra, extra pop, that extra separation, that extra depth. So yes, huge advantage in low light situations, indoor situations, bad light situations in general, but it also gives you that extra pop outside, even in ideal lighting situations as well. And before I go any further and tell you some of the cons of shooting wide open, I just wanna give a quick shout out to my friends over at Walton Craft for sponsoring this episode. Their bags have safely housed my expensive 1.4 lenses for almost a decade now. Wow, time flies. They were the first 
ever sponsor that I ever had, even before like sponsors were a thing. If you know me and you know my channel and you know my work, you know I don't take these things lightly. I am loyal to good people. I only work with brands and people that I genuinely like and believe in. And I truly believe in them and use their bags for all sorts of different situations. I got a whole collection behind me. <laughs> and if they didn't give them to me, I would buy them anyways, I promise. Check out their latest lineup of modular camera bags, their EDC bags, everyday carry bags, their straps, and even these new awesome little pouches here. They make these great little pouches here they just sent me. This one fits my Leica M10T barely with a 35 millimeter, but you can pack it up, you can put it in this little pouch. And those times that you just want to take out like a backpack or your everyday carry bag, but still want to take your camera because you should be taking your camera with you everywhere, this little pouch is perfect for that. You can check all that out with the affiliate link in the description box below. Another thing people might talk to you about that's worth mentioning, but not really a big deal to me is sharpness and bokeh and bokeh balls. But like, honestly, I don't care what my balls look like. <laughs> You know what I mean. I mean, I meant to do that pun, but you know what I mean. I don't. I don't really care what the bokeh balls, the shape of them, how much bokeh there is. It's not a huge deal to me. And yes, sharpness does matter, but I'm not like the type of person that's going to look at charts. So yes, if you are shooting a 1.4 lens at like 2.8 compared to a 2.8 lens at 2.8, most of the time the 1.4 lens will be a little bit sharper at 2.8. Honestly, a lot of people out there will tell you that's a huge advantage for me. It really doesn't matter. I've never had, I mean, I've always used like pretty decent lenses and up to the best lenses. But I've never ever had a client complain about the sharpness of my images. Just get it in focus, use a decent lens and stop looking at all those stupid comparison charts. Honestly, if it doesn't matter to me and most of my work, it probably shouldn't matter to most of you guys as well. So now what are the downsides? Well, the obvious one is price, size, and the not so obvious one is the temptation to abuse it. A 1.4 lens with good quality optics and autofocus is hefty and pricey. I use manual focus like a 1.4 lenses like this 35 Summulux here which I showed you at the beginning of the episode and so it's a manual focus lens so it's lighter so that takes care of the hefty part but it definitely doesn't take care of the expensive part because that Summulux lens is about $5,000. But most of the autofocus 1.4 lenses are quite chunky and they weigh a lot and they're also expensive like the Leica ones as well. And the other issue, the one that a lot of you guys will fall victim to because I have, this is the one I mentioned at the beginning of the episode about my editor scolding me. And okay, I sort of asked for it, but early on in my career, I was tearing it up for the New York Times. I was shooting all over Southeast Asia. I was their go-to guy for the region for several years. And being ambitious and eager to please, I always pestered my editor for feedback, something not so common in our industry, which is unfortunate, because I feel like an editor can offer great advice and insight and a different perspective on things and could have helped me grow even more as a photographer, but that's a whole other conversation for another time. But this editor was great, and it, you know, I pestered him enough that he finally caved, and he was like, all right, dude, you want it? He's like, you're overdoing it with 1.4. He's like, you're ruining some of your shots. Total, like, blobville. Because I'm a huge fan of shooting through things and using layers for context, but my out-of-focus foreground and background were becoming blobs, like he said. I was addicted to the pop. I wasn't thinking things through. I was just opening it up, shooting at 1.4, shooting everything. I was just like, Oh, that's interesting, 1-4, that's interesting, 1-4. And it wasn't. I wasn't shooting with thought, I wasn't shooting with purpose, I wasn't thinking it through. And I took his feedback seriously because of a well-established editor and it was the New York Times. And after six months in rehab of shooting a dedicated F7000 lens, I was released back into the wild and from there on in, I only use 1.4 with purpose. I was relying on it way too much, and I see it all the time. I see it with my online one-on-one -on -one students. They get a 1.4 lens, and they just take photos of what they see at 1.4, and they stop putting any thought into their composition, their light, their moments, their overall story, etc. They think it's good because it's shot at 1.4, and it's not. It's just slightly better. It has a more interesting look than if you shot something at maybe f4 or f5.6. Yes, but doesn't make it a good shot. Can't buy your way into being a great or even a good photographer. I strongly believe in that. The best way to improve, the best way to get better is to stop listening to me and go out and shoot. But if you need direction and motivation and accountability in your photography, I do offer one-on-one -on -one online mentoring aimed at all ages, all levels. I've got college students, I've got retirees. My mentorship is for anyone serious about improving. Or if you're game for a real adventure, you can check out my Northern Vietnam Photography Workshop taking place later this December. It's a very intimate workshop with only five students. You can check all this out at askmot.com or just check out the links in the description box below. So 
Just to wrap up, I, I work in a saturated and growing market that is quickly devaluing photography. So I'll take every single advantage I can get. Is it right for you? I don't know. Do you need it? Absolutely not. I don't know your budget. I don't know your goals. I don't know your motivation. You'll have to use your own brain to sort that out. I'm just telling you why and how I use it and why it works for me. I never like to tell people to rush out and go buy gear. You don't have to. The best thing you can do is go out and shoot. Thank you guys for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and don't forget to have a wonderful day.